so many of you know we've been going through a sermon series called Obadiah, and it seems like we just can't get through it, but we're working on it, folks. Two weeks ago, I was able to share with you background information about what our sermon's about, but then we hit the 815 mark and we all had to go. So I didn't get to tell you how to apply it, what it looks like, so we thought, okay, we'll just do this next week, and then spring break happened. And all of you guys went traveling and went off and had lots of fun going in caves and picking up crystals and and going and hanging out with your friends and drinking Coca-Cola and eating root beer, something like that. You don't eat root beer, but you get what I'm saying? I did. It was a mistake. And so we had three people here. So the Samuel, Ethan, and JC, we kind of discussed this a little bit last week, but I promise you guys it's the same material, but it's not the same material. So just listen in anyways, okay? We're going to breeze right through it. So Obadiah, before I read the text, I want to share with you a story of the time I broke my brother's printer at home. All right, so I'm a, I'm a sixth grade student about to uh, go into these more advanced classes. And our teachers say, hey, I want you to get on the computer and do this project. And so I'm like, oh, snap. I don't know how to work computers real well. But I got to do this project because I need to make an A to get into this program. And so here I am trying to mess with this computer, print out clip art. Do y'all know what clip art is? No, well, it's like little old school pictures. Um, They're ugly. Yeah, they're like little cartoons. And then we also had this thing called word art. So I would take clip art and put word art on top of it and to create some really lovely designs. It was fantastic. But then came the time where I needed to print it out, and that didn't go too well. Okay, so I'm all trying to print things out, and the printer just wouldn't go. So I, like, turn off the printer, then I, like, turn it back on, turn off the computer, turn that back on, just trying to get this document to be printed. And when it started printing, things went nuts. I'm saying it printed out like 50 to 100 pages of slop, of garbage, of random letters that don't make any sense, of a picture here, but it's cut off here, and page after page after page. My brother comes home, and he's like, Dustin, what'd you do to my computer? I ran outside. I ran for my life. No shoes or nothing. Just ran for my life. I was scared. Why? Because my brother was bigger than me. He was 6'3", 185, 190 pounds. And I knew that he would beat me in any wrestling match. He'd beat me in any athletic contest. So I better get out of there as quick as I could to escape the wrath of incoming doom. Now, he was mad at me because I quote-unquote, broke his computer, wasn't broken, it was just acting weird. It was fine. We got it to work out. But but it was scary because you don't like to make your older brother mad, and I did. So from here, we could pursue two routes. We could come together in a friendship and a bond and make things okay, or we can remain mad at each other. We could remain hostile towards one another. I'm thankful, and I'm here today to tell you that we made things okay, okay? I'm still alive when I could have easily not been, okay? Why do I share with you that story? Because it's a rival, or not a rivalry, that's the wrong word. It's a relationship between two brothers, an older brother, a younger brother, a brother who knows what they're doing, a younger brother who has no clue what they're doing. Here we go. But despite our differences, despite the knowledge gap, guess what? We remained connected. We remained strong brothers. Now, in today's story in Obadiah, we do find two brothers, Jacob and Esau. We understand the story and the history behind that because we talked about that two weeks ago. But long story short, Jacob steals the birthright from his brother Esau. Esau gets pretty mad. They go their separate ways for a little bit. But then when Jacob, soon to be known as Israel, comes back, 
His brother Esau opens up his, his arms in forgiveness towards his brother. Okay. So that's kind of the basis of where we're headed with these two, with this story. Now, next thing you know, we have an Israelite community and we have the community of Esau called the Edomites, and they are basically brother communities. But there's a problem. Israel is being attacked, and instead of the brother community Esau coming to their rescue, what do they do? They attack Israel too. So, y'all two brothers, stand up. Yeah, this is, this is nice. You can come on the stage. Come on the stage. So, we're going to pretend like this is uh, Esau because he's older, and this is Israel because he's younger. They're going to hug because they're, they just made out. They just said, hey, I'm sorry, and you are forgiven. So they're going to hug. And now they're going to go set up their community. So one brother's going that way, one brother's going that way. Y'all can go that way. It's good. And we got sound effects, folks. All right. So now younger brother's being attacked. So JC nicely attacked. Younger brother. All right, what should you do in this moment? You should help him, right? That's what should happen, but that doesn't happen, does it? No, what does this guy do? He goes and attacks him too. Go attack him nicely. No, no, no bloody eyes. All right, so this is what's going on, but Israel loses, sorry. Um, whether it's Babylon or another one of the war communities like the Philistines, they don't win, okay? We don't know what war specifically is going on. My guess is the Babylonians, but we don't really know. Give them a big round of applause. Good job. Thank you for participating, brothers. So that's virtually what's going on. We have the younger brother community, the Israelites being attacked, and Edom says, you know what? We're going to take their refugees and we're going to hurt them. We're going to see them, and we're going to celebrate by drinking. I see them in their shortcomings, and we are going to go to their cities, take their gold, take, those, take their silver, take their myrrh, assuming they had those things, and we're going to keep those. And we know that we're going to be okay in our city because we have these big, massive cliffs and these big, massive mountains, and no one can defeat us. So under that, we find Obadiah. And this vision given to Obadiah. Verse 8, In that day declares the Lord, Will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, those of understanding in the mountains of Esau? The answer to that question is yes, God would destroy them. Your warriors, team, and will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof, while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march to the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth. In the day of their disaster, you should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. But guess what? Despite this, it's exactly what they did. They cut down their survivors. They plundered the cities. They did not come to support Israel when Israel needed them. Instead, they turned their back on them. And that's just not what a good brother or sister does. So as we move into more of our application point of this message, because that's really what I, what I want to hone in towards today. We discovered the background a couple weeks ago. Today, let's talk about how to apply this message. One thing I want us to see is the sins of our past can haunt our future. Okay, What happened with, with Jacob and Esau is, is a difficult situation. Now, it was right for Israel to be blessed moving forward. But the manner in which it was handled was not correct. When you swindle someone, when you cheat someone out of their birthright, you know you're doing the wrong thing. 
You can cheat, you can lie, you can steal to get ahead, but your day is coming. So, Israel would have to take account for that, yes, for sure. But Esau, on the other hand, also had to wrestle with his. Yes, he was cheated. Yes, he was lied to. Yes, he was stolen from. But there was a period in his life where I have to imagine that he was angry, that he was bitter, that he was upset. Now, he works through these emotions so that when he sees his brother once again, they can come together in forgiveness. But oh, what journey must that have taken on him? What a toll that must have been. Forgiveness is hard. It's always important. We always must choose forgiveness, but it is hard. It is work. It is a process. Unfortunately for Esau, during this process of trying to overcome this great barrier in his life, he probably shared with those close to him his feelings. And so the feelings that he had, in a way, got passed down to generation, to generation, to generation. And so I think that's what kind of helped fuel this animosity between the two towns. Now, I can't say that for certain. I don't know. I was not there. I can just see the text and, and try to understand it, try to see the big picture, and try to apply it. I can't put forth my own human emotions into those situations as much as I want to. But this seems like a logical idea. Okay, I, I, It's not factual, but it seems like is probable. How this moment affected two cities, and it's like one city never truly got over it. That sin, that robbery, that trickery had a toll to play in the future. So you find these two towns, and instead of being strong, brotherly love, instead of sticking together, they fight, and they fight, and they bicker back and forth, and Edom doesn't let Moses go through, and, and next thing you know, King David is having a fight against the Edomites, and, and it's just turmoil between family. The sin of the past is haunting the present. And if we're not careful in this life, if we allow the past to creep into our life and fuel us, we can act in a similar manner. Now, we all believe that forgiveness is necessary. God teaches us, even in, in his prayer, the Lord's prayer, Father, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's important for us to forgive, but man, it's difficult. It's hard. When someone hurts you, you can say you forgive, but do you really? Do you really forgive? Now, if the answer to that is no, you have more work to do, okay? Because if we hold bitterness, if we hold a grudge, we're going to act very similar to what's going on in this passage. And let me be honest with you, that's not of God. Hate, anger, hostility towards your neighbor, that's not of God. That's not what he stands for. That's not what he's about. Yes, I know Jacob probably forgot to take out the trash. And it's, oh, good, good. And his parents might, might have got on to him. Or maybe they got on to his brother, and that caused frustration between the two. That's a silly example. I realize that didn't happen. But if we're not careful, we can let life dictate our emotions and how we treat people. I think that's what's going on here. Life has been difficult for these two cities, and instead of them coming together, they fight, and they fight, and they fight. The sin of the past is haunting their present, and it can haunt their future. And if we're not careful, we can allow our past mistakes to rob us of our current joy. We can let what someone said years ago about us impact our confidence and even impact our belief in who God says we are. So what can we do with this? We need to understand that sin does have power. But Christ came to offer himself as a living sacrifice to cast out sin as far as the east is from the west. 
If he doesn't hold that sin against you, why should you? In my opinion, if we do, that's arrogance. That's, that's us not realizing who God says we are. And it's putting our life at the center of our universe and setting instead of allowing God to be God of our universe. What do I mean by that? If God says that sin, he's not holding it against you, neither should you. You got to let it go. Got to let it go. It's hard. Ask God for help. Okay? Now, if it's an issue that someone has done to you, well, yeah, definitely go to them to try and make it right. But constantly, every day, every opportunity you have, ask God to say, hey, help me to forgive. God, help me to move past this. God, help me to not allow this situation to define my life. Help me to be different. Help me to be set apart. Help me to be made new. Help forgiveness to come and restore, restore the joy in my life. Make the best choice you can today. Second point is this. Love your brother. Now, I realize we've got to love our brother and our sister. Brother is a term that applies to everybody universal, okay? Everybody. Love your brother. What Israel needed from Edom, their cousins, they did not receive. They did not receive the support, the strength, the unity in that moment. But we can learn from that, can't we? We can see what they did not do, and we can tell ourselves we're not going to repeat that same mistake. When our brother's in trouble, what are we going to do? We're going to stand with our brother. When we're hurting, what are we going to do? We're going to come to their support, and we're going to help. When we see someone who's lost, who's hurting, who's broken, what we're going to do, we're going to go pick them up and take them to Jesus, the author of of life. You need to keep an eye out for your brother. It's not right for brothers to fight against brothers. It's not right for brothers and sisters to fight against one another. I was sharing this with Ethan and JC last week. You know, there's going to come a point where hopefully it's, you know, 80 years from now, your parents aren't going to be here anymore, okay? Hopefully that puts them at like 150, so that's a fair thing to say. Uh, we're not going to live to 150. We all know that. And when your parents are no longer here, your, your siblings, well, that's all you got. That's all you got. So I pray that in those moments you hold on to them and don't let anything get in the way of your relationship with one another. Now, there are a lot of siblings in the house tonight. Hear those words and apply those words. Family should stick it out together no matter what you go through. Your family. That's what families do. But let's take this beyond family. If you look around the room in here tonight, you're going to see some brothers and sisters in Christ. And you're here for one another. You're here to support one another. You're here to uplift one another. You're here to build a relationship with one another. You're here to invest into one another. And yes, I realize we're all different. We're all different. I like sports. I play Pokemon Go. Some people might think that's silly, right? Yeah, some people might, and that's fair. But yet, despite all that, we can still be friends, right? I might throw a dodgeball, and I might even hit you in the face with it. But we can still be friends, right? Yes. Yes, we can, because that's what people do. That's what the body of Christ does. We're different from all walks of life, all shapes and sizes. We all speak differently, but yet we can become one, and we should become one. So love your brother, and do me a favor, love God's people. We're going to get more into that next week, but man, God created everybody. Everybody you see in this room, everybody you see at school. The enemies, it's hard to love your enemy, but you got to. And we also love our neighbor. We love our neighbor as ourself. So uh, when you can't love your enemy, pray for your enemy, and I think that's going to help you. If you are mad at your enemy, pray for your enemy, and that's going to help. Okay, 
Let's continue on. Love your brother. When you see your brother struggling, you pick them up. When you see your brother in heartache, you be there to support them and comfort them. When you see your brother on top of the mountain, you're there to rejoice with them, not pull them back down. Love your brother. Care for your brother. And then lastly, if God sends you a warning, take notice and stop. I have to believe, I'm not sure this vision got to the Edomites or not. I hope it did. I'm not sure if it did. But God was giving them a warning of saying, hey, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. If you have refugees, don't cut them down. Don't go and plunder the city. Go, don't go and fight against Israel, my people, because if you do, I will avenge them. I think if God is calling us and he's telling us to stop doing something, we should. So what does that say to me? If God is calling me to stop sin, well, I stop sin. I cut it out of my life. If God is talking me or telling me to stop talking negatively, that means I need to stop talking negatively. If God is telling me to stop doing this certain behavior, you know what that means? I need to stop it. Why does God send this warning? Because he cares for us. Because he wants us to succeed in life. Because he wants us to live a life worthy of our calling. Why does God tell us to stop? To get our attention so that our life can be better. You know, there's a reason why he gave the Ten Commandments. It's not just to give you a bunch of laws to follow, to make you feel bad if you don't measure up. No, that's not why he did it. He gives you this, this roadblock, this, this map, so that you know how to live, so that you can be free of the pain of your mistakes. Because when you sin, it might not hurt now, but there's coming a time where it will hurt. And so if God is calling us to stop, well, we'll cut it out while you can. While it doesn't hurt so bad. Stop it while you can. Because if God's going to give you a warning, he's doing that on purpose. Because he doesn't want you to spend eternity away from him. He wants everyone who hears the sound of our voice today to spend eternity with him in heaven. How do you do that? You accept Christ as Lord and you follow him. Not follow you, you follow him. And he's going to lead you to some pretty cool places in the process. So if God's sending you a warning, stop, take notice, refocus your life, t turn your attention away from you and put it on God. And if you put it on God, you will be okay. So what can we learn from tonight's lesson? Let's go over those points again. One, the sins of our past can haunt our future. It did for Jacob and Esau, unfortunately. And it caused frustration between these two cities. But God still gives you grace. So rely more on his grace than the pain that's associated with that past. Number two, love your brother. Everybody, love your brother, your neighbor, those sitting next to you, the Christian, but yet the unchristian as well. A lot of times people in this world get mad at the unbelievers for the way they're living their life. Well, that ain't right. These people don't have a relationship with God, so how can we expect them to act right? Okay? It's our job to love them and to point them to Jesus Christ. And let Jesus Christ worry about their salvation. All we can do is take them to Christ. Okay? So you need to love the Christian. You also need to love the unbeliever so that we can bring those unbelievers to Christ. Because like I said earlier, Christ desires for no one to perish, but all to have everlasting life. We got to do our part. We got to love our brothers. Got to love our brothers. Whether they look different than you or not, whether they have a different belief system than you or not, we got to love our brothers and point them to Jesus. And point number three, if God sends you a warning, stop, take notice. Stop, take notice. If God is calling you to stop sin, well, stop it and focus on him. If God is calling you to forgive, forgive. If God is calling you to bring people to him, then you bring people to him. If God is calling you to stop something, take notice because he's telling you that for a reason because he doesn't want the sin to lead you down a path of destruction. Listen to God's voice. If you do that, you're going to be A-OK. -okay. So next week, we're going to learn more about this story. 
We're going to be looking at verses 15 through the end of the book. It's going to be a good lesson. Been working on that this week. I'm excited to speak on it. But next week is next week. This week, I think it's important for us to have a response time. Because maybe this sermon applies to you. Maybe God is calling you to forgive the past and then move on. Maybe God is calling you to, to love your neighbor and you struggle with that. But you know you need to. Maybe God is telling you to stop a certain thing in your life and you need his help to do it. Tonight we want to have an opportunity to pray with you because we know that God's at work in this house. God, we love you so much and we're thankful for you. We're thankful for tonight. We're thankful for the, the application of this message of everything we've been learning the past two, three weeks. I pray for your help because we're imperfect people. We don't always make the right choices. We don't always do the right things. But yet you love us. You offer us your grace. And you give us the tools necessary to move on from our past. Tonight we need that. You give us the tools necessary to love our brother, whether we agree with him or not. You give us the opportunity to love them. Help us to do that the way you did it. And we also know this, God. If you're going to send us a warning to stop, we know, we know that with your strength we can stop. So I pray that you help our students tonight. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad you're here. Do us a favor, be sure to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on your notifications to receive more from Grace Community. Have a great week.